Dismiss. It's already on mute. So that should be fine. Okay. All right. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Let's go back to this one. Yes. Okay. So she started, uh, I'm talking about this woman, Mother Mary Lang, for those who uh, are coming in late to the video. There were some video problems. Anyways. Um, so she started teaching children uh, in her home, and eventually, uh, somehow, she, she hooked up with uh, um, a, a Catholic priest, a French priest, a man who had come from France and emigrated over to the United States. His name was Father James Joubert. And Father Joubert noticed, you know, this is this is really uh, whatever. Um, this is really a good thing that this woman is doing, and he wanted to support her in that, and he wanted to maybe formalize it because he himself noticed, uh, as a priest, that a lot of the the Haitian immigrants that were coming couldn't read or write. Their children couldn't read or write. And he saw a need there and he saw what she was doing and he said, how, how could we, could you fill this need for us? And also have, you know, he thought about maybe formally organizing a group of, of sisters to help you in what you're doing, make it more of a religious situation than just people who are doing. You didn't have to do that, but, but Mary Lang felt, or I should say Elizabeth Lang felt called to that. She's like, yeah, father, I've been thinking about that for a long time. And so she did. She said yes, and she wanted to start this religious order, a group of, to gather some women around her who would, they would help each other, they would unite themselves in prayer and dedication to this commitment of, of teaching, especially black children, or I should say only black children because they probably weren't gonna be allowed to teach white children. Um, and it would be for African-American black women. This would be the first not technically the first, but the first to survive, because I was looking around for information and there was actually a group of black nuns that existed before this, but it, it went out of existence, didn't survive. Um, so this is the first one that, that actually did survive. And she called her group, the Sisters of Providence. And you might have it here on the webpage, let me just see. Or Oblate Sisters of Providence, excuse me, Oblate Sisters of Providence. Providence. The um, not Providence, Rhode Island. Providence meaning God, Providence. God, Providence is just a, a technical theological term for the fact, you know, God takes care of us. God, God has a will, God has a plan, and he guides us and helps us, and that's what we call providence in theology. Oblate is just another term for offering. So to make an oblation or something. Sometimes you'll hear this in the prayers at mass. Um, they use the word oblation. Could have probably translated as offering, so it would be more, I think, understandable, at least for me. Um, but the, yeah, their sisters, they've offered themselves to God's providence. How? By educating um, poor Blacks. So there you go. Uh, the community went along. She uh, she took the name of Mary, so, she, so she's known commonly as Mary Lang. She was also a few times the, well, she was foundress, obviously. She created the group with the help of Father Joubert. Um, but she also was the superior, the, the, um, the chief head of the group a few times. And so she's called Mother, Mother Mary Lang. And she died in 1882. And with so much in American history, especially during this period of time, uh, you can imagine that having a, a group of black women teaching black children how to read and write 
wasn't exactly on everyone's bucket list. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it was not necessarily something that was supported. And when Father Joubert died, he died before um, Mary Lang died. She found that some of the support for her work also died with him because he was, you know, he was the, a, a leader in the Catholic Church. Um, and so once his kind of sponsorship or help, you know, other people were like, well, why are we doing this? You know, people, were, they didn't see it as important. Um, but she soldiered on and the groups can, uh, soldiered on. It still exists today. I was just on their website looking stuff up. So if uh, you, you, know, you can go to the Oblate Sisters of Providence website where they're still there, they're still trucking, baby. Now, in the case of this beautiful woman, Mother Lang, she is on the path to sainthood as well. She's, she's not venerable. They, in the early 90s, the Archbishop of Baltimore opened up the case for canonization for, to look at the details to see, is this a person who was good, but also beyond good, did, did above and beyond. And so by opening that investigation, she reached the first level, as I told you, which is servant of God. So you can call, refer to her, I will refer to her as the servant of God, Mary Lang. Um, that doesn't mean you can't say, if, you know, shoot off a prayer to her every now and then. Um, but at this point, what they want are prayers to God for her canonization, that God may move, um, may, may show that she was a holy woman, that she deserves to be officially venerated in the church. But even if she was never, she never gets to that point of being officially venerated, like a saint, Saint Mary Lang, that doesn't mean she wasn't a saint. Okay, that this, you know, sometimes the historical record, you don't have a lot to go with but a person may have still been a saint in life, God knows. Nevertheless, we do know about her. And I ask you, servant of God, Mary Lang, to please pray for us all, that God may bless us and know that he does take care of us and cares about us in our lives because he sent us his son, Jesus, to show us that. And this was the Jesus whom you serve. And that may we, amen. Okay. Okay. Right away. Do, 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 do. There I am. I'll be back. And I put this and get back to the PowerPoint. Which one am I looking for? This one. Da, 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 da. Do, 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 do. Anybody now? Okay, we're going. I hope I did that because you get just uh, doing that, so that's fine. Okay. You saw that the screen went blank, yes? I'm hoping it didn't just crash on me. La, da, 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 da. Do, 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 do. And process. Well, I don't know what the process was again. It's in something. Okay, so at least it didn't end the Zoom meeting, but it ended the process on the PowerPoint. So let's get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so I put the U took the USB out, put it back in, let's see if that makes a difference. It seems to be. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay. Opening the PowerPoint. And now let's begin the show. Okay. 
Okay, so I ended, well, I was in the classical period. There's a little bit more to say about that. Okay. Let's see, did Mr. Uh, Swartwood come in? I thought I saw someone coming late, but I apparently I no. must have been my imagination. Whoops, went too far. And I was talking about these protest movements. You know, the, the priestly, the, basically what happened, and I think this happens in a lot of things. It doesn't matter if it's religion or politics, culture, things can start becoming top heavy. Things become, uh, there's so many rules and so many guidelines and so many regulations that things can become uh, burdensome to do. You know, it can be, become hard to, uh, to live life. Um, things can become too complicated. And that seems to be what started to happen in the classical period. People became overburdened by all these sacrificial rituals. They became so complicated in and of themselves to, that to perform them, you needed this whole priestly group. And so they had power in the community now. And people didn't necessarily like that. They didn't maybe didn't feel that they were having as much a direct experience of their religious beliefs. And so you had these protest movements like Jainism and Buddhism that kind of came up as, as reactions against all this overcomplication. But there was a response. Hinduism kind of reformed itself. It didn't get rid of the priestly class or the sacrifices, but there was a, a kind of response. One of the responses was simply to suppress you know, not so much the Jains as much as the Buddhists, <laughs> because the Jains are a small group. They're still a small group. They weren't even big back then. But the Buddhists started to, you know, gain a lot of followers, and that threatened people. So the, the, the Hindu society started to actively suppress the emergence and the extension of Buddhism and its influence. Um, you also start seeing that the, the Aryan religion of the Vedas this very different, in many respects, religion that's described and, and given evidence to in the Vedic writings starts to become Indianized. It starts to filter down and be taken up into maybe what you could call the native religions, the native gods and spirits that people believed in. And so names are exchanged and stuff like that. And then, you know, certain gods take on the names of other gods and some of their attributes and qualities. So there starts to be a mixing and it almost becomes like, oh yeah, the Vedas, they were our religion all the, all the time, you know, even though it's clear that there are differences. So the Vedas become quote unquote Indianized, you might say. They get in, in, inserted into the culture. And there is a um, a renewed focus on the gods. Not everyone can stick, you know, can stand hours long rituals, ritual upon ritual, like the priests are supposed to be doing. People can't live. So how do they relate to the gods and to the divine? Well, bhakti, this movement starts to um, arise. It may have been there already, but it's certainly re-emphasized or given a strong, stronger emphasis. Devotion, your devotion to a particular god is is enough or at least it's a path to lead you to uh some kind having some kind of stake in the religion even even low people who uh you know you can't perform all the rituals but you can have devotion you can go to a temple and see the statue of the god and pray to the god and offer offering okay and that that might be enough for your state in life so that offers an alternative to hours and hours of sacrificial rituals that period is the medieval period, which extends from the 1200s until the 1700s AD. Well, you can see the PowerPoint not much here. If you've seen me. And this is considered the medieval period here for India. Okay, the, the European medieval period is dated a little bit differently, beginning a lot earlier than India's medieval period. But it's kind of a bridge period, a middle age. Okay, it's in between 
the classical period and then what will become the modern period. And by the time of the medieval period, Buddhism, as you can see, is dead in quite literally because you have a group of people called Muslims, believers in the religion of Islam, who invade and do invade, it is an invasion, unlike the Aryan migration, into Northern I India. And one of the groups that they completely obliterate, and kill literally, are the Buddhists, the remaining Buddhist monks. Now, Islam had been present from an early, a early age on the outskirts of the Indian subcontinent in places like what we would call today Iran, Afghanistan, and it's been over here, but it hadn't really gone much further until the 1200s when uh, Pakistan, excuse me, I mean, I Iran, I forgot Pakistan. So in places like Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan, Due, mainly due to military efforts, as we'll learn with Islam after the death of Muhammad the prophet, uh, Muslim armies, Islamic armies, just start pushing up north, east, west, all over the place. And with those in conquering territory and with the conquering of territory, they bring their religion and um, kind of force, <laughs> you know, well, they offer an alternative, you know, they don't say become Muslim or die, but you know, they say become Muslim or you have to pay, you know, these heavy taxes if you're going to be a non-Muslim and they put all sorts of restrictions on your religious life. But there is this, you know, it is kind of an invasion out into the rest of the world. And finally, Islam reaches, in this period in the 1200s, Islam reaches Northern India and makes inroads into it to the extent that it basically dominates Northern India. And you have something called and I'll put it on the PowerPoint, I'll write it down. The uh, Delhi Sultanate, the city of Delhi is up here in the north. Up here is the city of Delhi. And the old city of Delhi is, the, you know, they built a new city near it called New Delhi, but this is where it is. And that was essentially the capital or the focus of power for this Muslim empire, kingdom, whatever you want to call it, that stretch across parts of northern India, and so it's called the Delhi Sultanate. Now, Sultan is just a word. It comes from Arabic, and all it really means is uh, a leader or a ruler. This word Sultan from Arabic it simply means like a ruler, a leader, I'm check my notes to make sure I know that because I have all these different terms for all these different political things. Yeah, okay. An authority figure is another way if you want a more generalized term for it. You know, any authority figure is a sultan, according to this Arabic, this Arabic word, but ruler will do. So the 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 ruler, the ruler of Delhi, the Delhi Sultanate. There was per when this happened, there was persecution of, I mentioned Buddhists already, but there was also persecution of the local Hindus. And that spelled the ultimate death for Buddhism, but Hindu continued. And here's a little picture that I got from somebody. You can see where I got it from on the bottom. Um, that this guy drew showing over the over this period of the medieval period, well, going up to the 1500s at least of how kind of the Muslim conquest of India ebbed and waned. So you have the early days, the 1200s, the Mamluks, okay? So here's basically following the Ganges River in India, this long river. Um, and then you see they get more territory later on in the Kilji dynasty, 1290. I think it's when Kil Kilji is the one who really kind of annihilates the Buddhists, destroys one of their universities. And that's kind of the end of that. Tobaluk dynasty, so you see with this, most of India, except for this part, most of what we call India was under the control of, of Islam, Islam. And then the Lodi dynasty near the end, it's back up in the north. But then after that, we have the Mughals or the Mughals as they're also called. Mughal is the traditional spelling and I prefer that. That's the one I grew up with. But nowadays you'll see it's spelled Mughal. And that went on for a long, long time from the 1500s until the, the middle basically of the 1800s. 
until the British basically took pretty much took over. How do how does Hinduism respond? Because you have now this situation where almost all the people are Hindus, and then you've got this foreign religion coming in and imposing itself on top of them. Um, you know, there were conversions. I mean, there are millions and millions and millions of Muslims because of this in India. And there were a lot more before the partitioning of India into the countries of India and Pakistan. I'm going to hope if people are using their phones, they're using them to take notes and not sending out texts to people. Because I can see, I can see, all right? So please take notes, pay attention. If you need to use your phone, I understand some people need to use their phones. Let me know, I, I understand. Okay, I'm not gonna go crazy over it, but just let me know, please. I'd appreciate that. Now with the 1500s, around the 1500s, this is also when the medieval, oh, excuse me, I skipped over it. Um, how does Hinduism respond to this, this new development? Well, usually by doing what a lot of groups seem to do, you do the opposite of the dominant group of the, of, well, you do the opposite of the dominant group. So for example, Muslims ate meat. They, they ate meat. So is Hinduism emphasized vegetarianism, a vegetarian diet, as opposed to eating cows, for example. Cows, you know, cows are kind of an early development within Hinduism. I know a lot of people think of, when they think of Hinduism, they think of, oh, they worship cows. They don't touch cows. They don't eat cows. And that's true today. But it was not always apparently true. The veneration of cows develops during this period in response to the practices of the Muslims who did eat cows, did eat cow meat. There was also a, a, a re-emphasis on caste purity, okay, re-emphasizing uh, caste is like, you know, what you're standing in the society. Some are up here, some are down here, okay? But it's not necessarily an over under type of arrangement. It's basically caste is like every person has his or her place in the society. And it also distinguishes who can hang out together. You know, people in certain castes cannot hang out with people of other castes. In some cases, they can't even look at them because <laughs> they're, they're so untouchable. Um, but anyways, so they there's a re-emphasis on this within Hinduism, this caste system to distinguish them from the outsiders, the Muslims. In the 1500s, in about the middle period of this medieval period, the 1500s, enter the Europeans. It's in the 1500s where Europeans start sending out boats, ships, to explore the world, to find easier passages for trading and for business ventures that uh, Europeans start arriving. Not that Europeans hadn't been there before and didn't know about India, because we know from example, for, for just one example, Alexander the Great, um, this, uh, this military leader and political leader from a long, long time ago, the Greeks, okay, pushed all the way into Northern India as well, into places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. You can even see some of their, their influence in the statuary and the artwork that still exists there. Um, so, Europeans knew about India and had some contacts, but not, not as direct as they could by getting on a boat and actually going there. It was, it was a long trek um, across mountains and valleys. But here come the Europeans in the 1500s. 1510, the Portuguese establish a colony in Goa, here on the coast, around here, if I remember, well, I think it's around here, yes. Around here on the western coast, the, uh, in 1510, the Portuguese establish a permanent settlement called Goa. 1510, and they did not, actually did not lose it until 1961. It was technically part of Portugal until 1961, when the Indians took it away. The Indian government simply was hoping that Portugal would give it back. The Portuguese government basically said, no, I don't think so. And the Indian military simply invaded Goa and took it away from the Portuguese. So you can see that for like four, 400 years, 
okay? You have this presence of Europeans there. And, and it wasn't just the Portuguese. They, they kind of started the ball rolling, but then you had the British, the French, the Danish, apparently had some cities, some, some colonies there. Um, the Dutch, especially in Sri Lanka, this island down here. In fact, they, they left their language and ideas. I remember I spoke with a, a Sri Lankan woman um, who lives in a community nearby where, where I live. And she was talking about, she kept you talking about the burgers, the burgers. Well, burger is um, a term for a city in Dutch, a, a burg, you know, a burg, you know, like Pittsburgh. You know? It's a German word, but they kept, they use it to describe these kind of, I think they're people of mixed Dutch and local like Tamil and Sinhala race and stuff. I think they're called burgers. I have to look it up, but that seemed to be my impression of what you were saying, but there's this particular group of people in, in Sri Lanka. So they left their language. Okay. At the medieval period, we have the modern period, which is commonly called Hindu revivalism. Around the time of the 1700s, you have um, a particular group of Europeans, the British, who are able to um, insert themselves in many ways into the subcontinent of India and eventually take over. This is an old map called the Indian Empire. It's not the Indian Empire, it's really the British Empire in India, the, the areas that were controlled. And what you can see is all the red areas are directly controlled by the British. So it's not, it's nothing in history is, uh, is cut and dry, you know, as clear as you might think. So, I mean, but they didn't control everywhere. All the red portions, yes, but all these yellow portions were like local principalities, local kingdoms, local Indian rulers that were controlled directly by those Indian rulers. So the British didn't necessarily take over everything, but they kind of did because they were the big power brokers in the area. They had the best military. So all of these princes and local rulers kind of did what the British told them to do. They were all in alliances with the British. So they weren't completely independent, but eventually you have the British Raj from 1848 to 1947, where essentially the, the, the British crown, the, the king or the king, queen of England, depending on who it was at the time, Took, they basically took over control of the whole sub, of, of the whole subcontinent. So, colonialism. India was essentially a colony of a Western country. It was not independent on its own. Um, until, of course, you had um, an independence movement under Gandhi, which happens in the late 1940s, which is why the British Raj ends in 1947, and you have the Republic of India started in the 1948. And then what happens is that the Muslims, there's this, still this kind of, just, uh, this, well, still this kind of separation with the Muslims uh, who are the descendants of the previous invaders. And they basically separate off into the country that's known as Pakistan now. It was part of India, the Republic of India but they partitioned it and decided, no, we're gonna separate off. That's how the Indus River ends up in a Muslim nation, even though it's, it's the, the old, the, where the name for Hindu comes from, okay? It's separated off, and then you have people having to migrate. All the Hindus have to leave Pakistan because they're Hindus, not Muslims. And all the Muslims, they wanna get them out of India into Pakistan. And as what happened, as which, as, Kind of sometimes happens in such situations of you know past history and hatred and stuff like that. There you know violence ensues. There people are angry. They have to move, um, and so there was violence and all sorts of stuff. So it wasn't it wasn't a good period of time. But nevertheless, India had its independence in the nineteen late nineteen forties after the Raj. But Hindu revivalism. What is that from a religious perspective? Well, now that you have Europeans all over the place, now you have a you have a different uh, a different influence. You had the the Muslim invasion, so you had that influence of Islam, or the presence of Islam. But now you have a different presence, Christianity, which actually Christianity had been in India for almost two thousand years. There had been Christians on the eastern coast down here 
of India for a long, long, long time, long before the Muslim nation showed up. But nevertheless, they were a small community, but you have, now you have the, the European Christians coming, Protestant and Catholic, and dominating their society, Hindu society. And so there was a reaction against that called Hindu revivalism, an attempt to revive and reform Hinduism against what they kind of saw as this new invasion of these foreigners with their foreign beliefs. And so Hindu leaders, there are various Hindu leaders and groups that were formed. I'm not going to go into them, but just to say in general, Hindu leaders responded by trying to reform Hindu ideas uh, in a way, make them more Western. So for something like idol worship, the fact that uh, there are these, these uh, statues and images that made out of wood or stone or whatever that are worshipped in a, in a Hindu temple. And they are worshipped. I mean, people treat them as if they're gods. They come, the god comes into the idol and it, and it kind of awakens it and activates it in a way. The god is now present in the idol. So you by worshiping the idol, you are actually worshiping the god. And then the god goes to sleep, it goes away, comes back later when you perform sacrifices, more sacrifices. So they try to, in some Hindu revivalists try to kind of revise this from a Western point of view by saying that, you know, idols are kind of like representations. It's like, you know, the crucifix. It's not a real image of Jesus on the cross because none of us was there. We, we know how the Romans crucified, so we have an idea of how it was probably done. But, you know, if someone bows his head or her head to it or whatever, you know, you don't think, oh, they're worshiping this piece of plastic or wood or, or whatever the cross is, the crucifix is made out of. Or if you bow your head to say a picture of the Virgin Mary or Mother Mary Lang, a holy woman, I know it's not her. It's an image of her. It's a JPG. You know, it's not her, but it represents her. I mean, is that is an actual photograph of her? So it is an, an accurate likeness of what she looked like. But I know it's not her, but I am honoring the memory and her presence where I believe she is in heaven. And so Hindu revivalists tried to kind of use those ideas to apply them then to Hinduism. You know, people aren't really worshiping the actual stone, wood, or whatever that the idol's made out of. They don't actually believe that it awakens and the God kind of wakes up in the idol. No, 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 no. What's going on there is just a representation of Shiva and you're just honoring his memory or his presence wherever he is, um, stuff like that. There was also a belief to, or excuse me, a movement to get rid of the caste system. Um, not that Europeans didn't have a caste system or don't, um, where there are some people who are better and some seen as better and some as worse. I mean, just ask Elon Musk. You know? <laughs> I mean, we usually base it now on money. If a person's a billionaire, then they're at a higher level. I might want to hear what that person says. And if it's just me, if it's just me, someone says, who are you? Nobody, shut up. <laughs> you know, but Mark Cuban's on Shark Tank. I'm not. <laughs> well, I also couldn't really make any bids on anything unless they, you know, I'll give you 10 cents for 15% of your company. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good deal. I, I'll have to pass on that, Mr. Wonderful then I'm out. And even monotheism, they, they tried, some Hindu revivalists tried to reinterpret Hindu religion, which has many gods. I mean, you can't miss it. <laughs> the gods, they have a god for everything just about, but try to kind of reinterpret that as a form of just monotheism. There really is only one god, but you know, this God has many faces and representations and people depict this God in many ways, but it's really monotheist. We're really monotheist. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure that one flies very well, but it was an attempt. It was an attempt to try to reform Hinduism to make it more palatable to the West or at least more understandable to the West. And also explain, try to present Hinduism to the West as something equal to Western culture and even better. You had groups that were had no problem saying, look, Hindu, you know, our religion is, is just as good as Christianity. In fact, it's even better. And this, so they didn't cut, they didn't, uh, they didn't mince any words. They didn't try to reinterpret Hinduism into something it wasn't. They said, Hinduism, our religious beliefs as they are, are just as good as yours and maybe even better. 
just to give one example, sometimes you'll hear from, sometimes you hear, um, and I've heard, you know, you might, a, a Christian might be talking about Jesus to a Hindu and, and say that Jesus is the incarnation of God and appearance of God in the world. And a Hindu person might say, well, that's great. Well, you have one. In Hinduism, we have like 12. <laughs> Vishnu, the god Vishnu has appeared uh, amongst humans many times. So we actually have more appearances of God than you, which makes our makes the argument is leading towards the argument that therefore Hinduism is better. We you have only one appearance and that's it. You don't have any more, Jesus. But we have Matsya, uh, Parirasha, we have Krishna. We have uh, other, you know, there are other names for these people, but, you know, Brahma, we have, uh, Vishnu, uh, the dwarf priest. We have uh, Kalki, who's brought Vishnu coming at the end of the world. We have all sorts of things, all sorts of appearances of God amongst men. So that would be, an, so that was a kind of a pushback to what Christianity or this Christian culture that they felt was threatening their beliefs so revive, revive Hinduism so that it doesn't die, so that everyone doesn't convert to either Islam or to Christianity. How do you do that? You reform or you just re, re, uh, re reform and reinterpret or you reaffirm, you reaffirm You say, yes, our beliefs are just as legitimate as yours. And maybe in some cases they explain ultimate reality better than yours. Okay, so that's a little bit of the hit, a little background on the history of the Hindu religion, and to some extent, Hindu history, the history of India. This was just a little quote. This is an example. For, this is one of the reactions, for example, of uh, the Hindu revivalists from this man, uh, Dwijendranath Tagore, who apparently is a famous, uh, I think he's a poet, thinker, but you know, he, uh, this is a quote from him. He did not write this, but this is a quote from this book by a missionary, a Christian missionary called E. Stanley Jones. He's a Methodist missionary who spent decades in India. And, uh, and, and he would go around, he would talk to some of these great thinkers, and he, he wrote a book about his experiences of having been a missionary in India and his various encounters with Indian thinkers, and he called it the Christ of the Indian Road. Basically, I think, trying to talk about how he found Christ in India, even amongst people who were not necessarily Christian. And he has a couple of comments about the situation of how the Indians looked out at the Westerners because they would, they would try to, they want the, the Indians to convert to Christianity, but as this, this scholar and thinker points out, Christians don't act like Christ. They didn't treat the, the Hindus or the Indians like Jesus said people should be treated. They treated them like they were second class in their own country, in their own land where they came from treated them that they, they were second class, that only you know, the whites were superior, the white Europeans were bringing superior ideas, superior culture, superior technology, and were racially superior, which seemed totally different from the message that Jesus is preaching. So Jesus is ideal, you know, Jesus is the standard and he's wonderful, but you Christians are not like him. So it's not that you know, there, there was kind of, even amongst the Hindu revivalists, there was a kind of acceptance of Jesus as a moral philosopher, as a great wise man, even as one of the incarnations of Vishnu, one of the appearances of Vishnu, maybe. Um, but they weren't going to accept Christianity because they saw how the Christians treated them. So that's that. Da, 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 da. This is Hinduism three. Yeah. And, yeah. Off. I can't breathe. Whew, man. Sacred writings. Sacred. What are the sources of authority for Hindu religion? Make sure that uh, okay. Okay, I just want to make sure because sometimes the 
the window will be on top. So apparently this time it's not. The sources of authority fold. There are two types of authority. We can call them scriptures, sacred writings, sacred writings. Although there were no sacred writings at first in Hinduism. I mean, Hinduism is such an old religion. Um, and the, you know, people, I mean, there was a time when people didn't write a long, long time ago. So how did you, how did you learn things? How did you know things? Well, people talked to each other and people had to learn. They would pass on orally information by word of mouth and people would memorize it and learn it. Okay. Um, messages between people, long stories, religious texts, all sorts of things. So people would learn things by word of mouth. There were no uh, sacred writings for Hinduism. The, 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 the teachings were passed on by word of mouth, orally. And it was passed on from teacher to student. The teacher would recite or sing, sing the teaching to the student and the students would repeat. They would learn the melodies and, and they would repeat back to the teacher. But as things progressed and, and writing was invented at some time, some human beings figured out that they, they could make something to, you know, they could write on not just images or pictures, but creating of alphabets and symbols that could represent words and concepts. Then you could have writing, but once, and, and especially as things became more complicated, the, the teachings grow grew, I should say, excuse me, and things became more complicated and, and hard, hence harder to memorize, these oral teachings, which really should be passed on by word of mouth, nevertheless, they got written down. And so we have sacred writings in Hinduism. But the ideal is really to pass things on by word of mouth. It's not to, to have books. So there are two types of Hindu sacred writings. There are those that are classified as Shruti and those that are classified as Smriti. The word Shruti comes from Sanskrit and means something that's heard. So notice that oral element to it, oral being ear, word of mouth, you hear it. Okay, it's a sound, what is heard. And then you have Smriti, which is a remembrance, a recollection, something that is remembered, that which is remembered. Shruti is the, of the higher variety. It's, it's direct, basically it's direct revelation. Okay, it's a direct revealing of this um, uh, foundational reality of the universe, which I'll, I won't talk about now, but anyways, it's the sacred and divine truth of the universe. This reality that is the foundation of all reality and of which there is, it, it pervades everything. It's in everything. It's the source of everything. It is not a God, it is the source of, of reality. So that's a difference. And Smriti is indirect revelation. Okay, Smriti is something that um, is, not, is not eternal, like it's, it's derived from Shruti and it develops out of Shruti, so it's indirect. Shruti is a direct revelation and, and it's believed that um, the, the, the writings that are contained in Shruti were directly revealed to these ancient um, seers, visionaries called rishis. And so I give you the definition there. Rishi in Sanskrit simply means a seer, someone who has visions. They saw, they were given a direct sight into the truth, the ultimate truth of the universe. And these visionaries, the rishis, were the ones who wrote down the shruti, the various, uh, usually as hymns, songs, okay, but the, the rishis are, are the ancient seers that I'm referring to there in the definition. They were inspired wise men who were able to understand this divine and eternal knowledge of the universe. And so in the stories about the rishis, um, there are several of them, I'm not going to go over all of them, but, you know, and, and the numbers vary about how many of them there were, um, but whatever. 
It's probably mythological. It's probably just made up. You know, no one was there, so we don't know. But they were known for their great wisdom, and they had a lot of supernatural abilities. You know, they could fly. They could work miracles. They have all sorts of these supernatural abilities. But the main thing is, is that they hear the sound of the universe, and they pass it on. They, they, they uh, perfectly uh, uh, present it to humanity and it eventually will get written down in the Shruti literature. The Smriti, as I said, is related to the Shruti and develops out of it. Both of these, though, are, all, are authoritative for Hindus. The Shruti texts that belong to the Shruti form and texts that belong to the Smriti classification, they're both authoritative, but Shruti is always authoritative. It's the, the texts that belong to Shruti are akin to like the Bible um, for Christians. The Shruti encount encompasses, well, I'll mention that, and I'll just remember to mention that. The uh, Shruti literature, put that down there. The Shruti literature is divided up into basically four things. The Vedas, these books, the series of books called the Vedas, the, basically they're wisdom books, books of knowledge. Then you have the Brahmanas, or the Brahmins, I guess, but Brahmanas. The, you could pronounce it, Aran, I would say Aranyakas, but apparently it should be pronounced Aranyaks, Aranyaks, some, the A is silent at the end, the Aranyaks. And finally, the Upanishads. Now, the S at the end means plural. So there are four Vedas. So there's one Veda, two Veda, three Veda, four Veda. The Brahmanas as well. There are multiple, the, the Brahmana and the Aranyaka, or the Aran, Aranyaka, or the Aranyak, and the Upanishad. There are many Upanishads. So those are plural. And the Smriti texts are five, I didn't, uh, five. The Ramayan, the Ramayan. Number two, the Mahabharata or Mahabharata. Number three, the Bhagavad Gita. Four, Dharma Shastras. And five, Puranas. So the Shruti, I'll get to in a moment. I'm not gonna focus a lot on the Smriti just because the Smriti involves an immense amount of literature. Um, Hinduism has many, many, many sacred writings. And it seems like just about every flavor of Hinduism um, and almost it seems like every god and goddess has all sorts of mythology and texts associated. So it's an immense amount of literature uh, most of it, almost all of it, is contained in the Smriti, not in the Shruti. So just, you know, there's no time to go over the Smriti. But the Smriti is an immense amount of literature. It includes things like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which are historical epics. <laughs> Let's see, Hannah is the best. Anyone know C.A. Hannah? <laughs> You know, texts like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are historical epics. They're long uh, stories, hence they're epic. Usually an epic is very long. Um, in poetic form, which is also part of the genre of an epic, a long story told in poetic form. Um, but they're based in, in historical, what they say are historical events. For the most part, I mean, the Mahabharata is huge. It's believed to be the longest written poem in human history, the longest poem written by humans. So it's, it's huge and, and it's huge because it includes not just the general overarching story, the arc, but includes all sorts of other little books and, and things that are just stuck into it and made part of the story. Sometimes where's the connection? Not the connection is just stuck into the story. So the Mahabharata. So that's why you have an arrow here going to the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of this historical epic. But the Bhagavad Gita 
uh, is more of a philosophical text. It's, it's kind of an outline. If you want a good outline of Hindu philosophy and view of the world, even theology as well, it's also a theological text for this, this conversation with a god. Um, this man, Arjuna, is having a conversation with the god Krishna. And I think in the next class, I'll come back to it and talk about it just a brief little bit. It's one of the readings. Arjuna is talking to the god Krishna. But it's not, you know, it's part of the story, but it's, it's oftentimes separated out. It can stand on its own without the story. And it's a fascinating little work of philosophy and theology. The Dharma Shastras are law books. You have the word Dharma here, which, as you know, means basically order, or the, the you know the, the the what underlies the universe Dharma, which gives it structure. So Dharma can also mean law, as you know, morality. So books of Dharma, Shastra is a book. So law books, legal codes, and the Puranas are myths. So here's where you're like, you got every god has all these myths. They have all these myths. And so there's many, many, many books of Puranas, which outline the myths of, of the gods. So those would be the Smriti. They're not direct revelation. They, you know, they, they have maybe more of a human source, but they derive from the beliefs and the teachings of the, the Shruti literature. Let's start with the Vedas. The Vedas, the word Veda simply means knowledge in Sanskrit. And you might notice some connection with the, the English word wisdom. Wisdom. Because the V is often pronounced like a W in Sanskrit. It's more like a Veda. Veda. Um, wisdom. So you have the W and you have the D. W, D, Veda. So again, English and Sanskrit are related languages. So wisdom, knowledge. Books of wisdom, you could call them. They were written between 1200 and 600 BC. Oops. They are oral poetry. Again, oral poetry. They were passed on by word of mouth in poetic form before they were written down during this period. They weren't all written at once. There was development. Some Vedas came first and some came later. And the focus of the Vedas is almost exclusively on the correct and proper performance of the sacrificial rituals. The performance of sacrifices, fire sacrifices in particular, was a main focus of Hinduism. It still is in some ways, but especially in olden times, big focus. Because then, you know, think about it. there was no TV, no internet. What else do people have time to do? You know, at the end of the day, you're tired. You well, let's do a sacrifice. You know? How long is it going to take? Oh, three hours. Well, where else am I going to go? What else do I have to do? Yeah, you know? it's entertainment. It has entertainment value. Um, so you had these these really big sacrifice sacrifices, and so you need to know what hymns to sing at them, how to sing the hymns, how to perform the ritual. And the Vedas provide this knowledge. The study of the Vedas is restricted to high caste males. Women were not allowed, and traditionally, even today, women are typically not allowed to study the Vedas because they're, even if they're high caste, of the higher caste. Why? They're not males. Only high caste males are allowed to study the Vedas. And there is initiation right at a certain point in, in the Hindu man's life, if he's of a higher caste. He will be initiated and he'll receive like a, what's called the sacred thread, a kind of thread. Just like some guys, you know, wear necklaces with a cross around their neck. It doesn't mean anything to them, but it might show their attachment to their family or whatever. So the sacred thread just shows that, you know, you are now have come of age to be initiated into the study of the Vedas, the sacred books. It also identifies you as a high caste Hindu. So the Vedas are four, actually three, but can now four. And there they are, the Rig, the Yajur, the Sama, and the Atharva. All written in Sanskrit. So their names are from Sanskrit. 
The first one, the, the first and the oldest one, the rig, comes from Sanskrit, ridik, which means, well, it can mean two things, praise, but a verse. So it's referring to the verses. Yes, Ness. Oh, excuse me. Apologize. So it's referring to, it's referring to the verses. It means praise, but it's used in the sense of the praises. The praises, each verse is praising some God or related to praising some God. So it becomes extended to mean the verses of the hymn. So if you have Ridigwed, then you have knowledge of the praise, the knowledge of the verses of the hymns that are supposed to be said during the sacrifice. And the rig is a collection of around, uh, you know, it, depend, it depends on how you count it, but you know, around 1,020 hymns to various gods and goddesses, around 100, you know, around 1,020 hymns to gods and goddesses, and each hymn is dedicated to a particular god or goddess, so that's how you kind of know what the hymn is about. So Indra, it'll say at the top, you know, Hymn number 100, Indra, it'll tell you. And so you know that that hymn is primarily dedicated to that God. It's given to us in 10 books. There are 10 books of the Rig Veda. Books two through seven are the oldest. Books two through seven. And everything else is, is later. So book one, books eight, nine, and 10 are later. They're added on to the, the core books, which are books two through seven. And as I said, the hymns are arranged usually according to the gods who are addressed. So as I mentioned, Indra. So all the hymns to Indra might be, try, they try to keep them together or hymns to Agni and stuff like that. They, very, they try to keep the hymns together to give it some organization. I mentioned Indra, of course, because Indra is the most addressed of the gods in the, uh, in the Rig Veda. And Indra was the supreme god of our old friends, the Aryans. He was the bringer of rain. He was the bringer of rain. So The second one is the Yajur. The Yajur, which comes from Yajus, which I have is sacrificial formula. It can also be mantra, the word mantra is appropriate here. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically the formula that you need to say in or, during the sacrifice in order to effect what you want, which is basically the presence of the God that you're sacrificing to. So it, the Yajur is a man, it's knowledge of these mantras. It's a manual of sacrificial prayers and formulae that are used by the priest who is performing the sacrifice. And I should say that in Hindu sacrifices or ancient Hindu sacrifices, there are like four priests to do a sacrifice. Um, so you need it, and they have various roles. But the one who was performing it needed to know these mantras, to, the right mantras to say at the right time. So this book was for him. And throughout the Yajur, there's also the attempt to explain the ritual, to explain the meaning and the significance of the various mantras which is very interesting um, for giving you, you know, for later developments in Hindu religion. The third one is the Sama. Okay, you've got the hymns, but you need melodies. You need to, to learn how to sing the hymns. And so Sama means a chant or a melody. And so that's where you find the, the melodies in the Sama. And the Sama, is the collection of the songs and melodies, and it's basically a repeat because the rig is the essential hymn book. The so sama is essentially a repeat of the rig up above. Okay, so just about everything that's found in the rig Veda, or everything that's found in the rig Veda, is found in in the sama. In fact, the, in the little interesting little statistic that I, I found in one of my books was that all but 75 verses are found also in the Rig Veda. So the Rig Veda is found completely in it, and only a mere 75 verses are unique to the Sama. So it's basically the Rig Veda, but focusing on what melodies need to be used for each hymn. 
These three are called the threefold Veda, or the threefold knowledge. And these seem to have been the original collection of the Vedas. But there is a fourth, the Atharva, that comes later. It is the last and the lowest of the Vedas and was originally not considered part of them. And how it actually became part of the Vedas is not completely clear, not exactly clear. But why is it called the Atharva? Because it's named after this, this mythological figure called Atharvan, who is the father of fire. Okay, kind of like Prometheus in the great in the, in Greek uh, mythology. Prometheus was the god who brought fire to humanity. Atharvan is the creator of fire. And why did he do that? He, he created fire so that there could be fire worship. You could have the fire sacrifice. And so that's very important. You can't have, you can't have this whole, you can't have the rig, yajur, and sama without the fire sacrifice. So the people who wrote this book later trying to maybe, I don't know, boost themselves up in the esteem and make themselves more important than maybe they are by saying, yeah, okay, you've got the Rig, the Yajra, and the Sarma, but we got the Atharva, you know, we have, you know, we, we have the, the origins of the sacrifice. You need the fire to perform the sacrifice. So this might have been kind of a way to grease, maybe grease the way for the acceptance of the Atharva into Hinduism, into the, into the Vedas, since fire worship was so big in Hindu sacrifice. And this will be my last point about the Atharva, because we have a reading from the Atharva, I think. Well, maybe not, but I, I think I have a PowerPoint later. But what is the Atharva filled with? Basically, a whole bunch of stuff, charms, curses, there are hymns, maybe magical stuff. There are hymns for bringing healing. There are hymns that you can sing to the gods to inflict injury on others. There are hymns of praise. There are philosophical speculations about the meaning of life or order in the universe. And these are all mixed in together. These are all mixed in together. The thing that unites them is that they claim to come from these descendants of the father of fire, Atharva. And so that gives them importance. And eventually at lends to uh, or bringing the Atharva into the Vedas themselves. Okay, well, have a good day. I'll see you on Thursday. Okay. I still can't say there's too much information. It's too much information. I mean, I've pruned and pruned and cut away and spoke. Ah, man. All right, I'm still here. I'm gonna, oops. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here for just a few minutes. Just to, uh, okay, I think I'll turn off now. Okay.